thank you for having us. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, ALS and palliative care in ALS. Um, I am Dr. Jocelyn Zwicker. I'm a neurologist um, treating people with ALS uh, as part of the neuromuscular clinic. And we'll move aside for my colleague. Hi, I'm Jill Rice. I'm one of the palliative care physicians with the Division of Palliative Care at University of Ottawa. And I work in the neuropalliative program as well as with our PCT and a few other places where I've met a lot of people from. And hi, everybody. I'm Christine Watt. I'm another one of the palliative care physicians, and I work in the neuropalliative program and uh, primarily at St. Vincent uh, in the palliative care unit there. Hey, I'm going to uh, present first, uh, and then uh, you'll hear more from palliative care physicians. So uh, I guess we'll get through the uh, disclosures first. It doesn't seem to be forwarding. Let's see. Just click this. It should work now on the arrow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, Dr. Jill Rice. Uh, um, works, oh, gets uh, honoraria from Pallium Canada and is an employee of the Briar Continuing Care in the Ottawa Hospital. Dr. Christine Watt has received a grant from the LS Society of Canada and also works at Briar Continuing Care in the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, and I have also received a grant from ALS Canada uh, and have uh, received money from Amalax Pharmaceuticals and Michibichi Tanabi Pharma Canada, who make uh, medications for people with ALS. And I practice at the Ottawa Hospital. I also receive a stipend from the TOH Medical Staff Association. Mm, we have not received from por support from this program for a nonprofit organization. And as I said, these, my potential conflict of interest is that I have received honoraria from companies that make medications for people with ALS. Um, so the objectives for the talk today uh, are to describe the natural history and varied clinical features of ALS, uh, which is primarily my job. Uh, and then to identify and manage the common symptoms related to ALS, to identify and address common psychosocial issues that arise in patients with ALS and their care partners, and to develop an individualized approach to advanced care planning in patients with ALS, which uh, Jill and Christine will tackle. Uh, there are medications that will be discussed that are off-label, um, because that's the nature of medications for symptom control of ALS. Okay, so we before we go too far into this, what is ALS? Um, so it is a neurodegenerative condition that affects motor neurons. Uh, and so the motor neuron of the motor pathways consists of an upper motor neuron, a neuron in the cortex that sends a projection all the way down the spinal cord to a ne motor neuron in the spinal cord, which sends a projection to the muscle. And that is the way there's these two motor neurons that, uh, uh, in the pathway that translate a thought to move to an actual movement from the muscle. And ALS is characterized by degeneration of both of those types of neurons, the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. It's actually pretty common. So the incidence is two per 100,000 persons per year in Canada, which is actually the same incidence as multiple sclerosis. However, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis is much longer because the, there are more patients living longer with multiple sclerosis compared to ALS. It does tend to be a disease for older adults. So the mean onset is 62 years old, although it can strike even in the 30s. Um, and so how do we make the diagnosis of ALS? And it is largely a clinical diagnosis, but it is usually people present with progressive painless muscle weakness, which happens over weeks to months. 
Um, usually 75% of people present with weakness in the arms or legs or actually more commonly the hands or feet. So hand weakness is a common presentation or a foot drop, maybe another presentation. Usually it's asymmetric, may affect both sides, but one side worse than the other. 20% of people present with trouble swallowing or speaking. Rarely people's presenting complaint is shortness of breath. So the, which makes the diagnosis a bit more challenging, but that is a possible presentation. Of note, sensory symptoms are not a big component, usually of the uh, symptoms at onset, and there's no bowel or bladder dysfunction. And in terms of the signs, what we're looking for are upper motor neuron findings and lower motor neuron findings. Upper motor neuron findings suggest problems with the motor neuron in the cortex. And so by upper motor neuron findings, I'm talking about hyperactive reflexes, um, spasticity or an upgoing Babinski reflex. Lower motor neuron findings, I'm talking about fasciculations and muscle atrophy. And then more specifically, when we're doing our assessment, we actually look for those upper motor neuron findings and lower motor neuron findings in four different segments. The first segment is the bulbar segment, so the cranial nerves or the face. Um, the second segment is the cervical segment, which is the arms. The third segment is the thoracic segment, which is the trunk. And the fourth segment is the lumbosacral segment, which is the legs. Um, so in terms of lower motor neuron findings in the bulbar segment, we're looking for atrophy of the tongue or a nasal speech, which sounds like they have a cold or fasciculations of the tongue. Uh, and then upper motor neuron findings, we can actually get a jaw jerk reflex, which can be brisk, or we're looking for primitive reflexes, reflexes that should be suppressed in an adult person, like a snout reflex where we tap the lip and the lips kind of pout reflexively. And we also listen for a spastic speech, like a forced effortful speech. In the cervical segment, for the lower motor neuron findings, we're looking for atrophy or fasciculations and specifically in the hand muscles. And for upper motor neuron features, we're looking for hyperactive reflexes and we can do special reflexes like flicking the finger and seeing the thumb come in, which is a Hoffman reflex. In the thoracic spine, we can look for fasciculations, but there's really no upper motor neuron features. And in the lumbosacral area, again, we're looking for atrophy and fasciculations, and we can look for hyperactive reflexes, upgoing Babinski or plantar reflexes. We can look for clonus, which is when you move the foot back and it keeps beating. And sometimes people even have spontaneous clonus or we can tap the inside of the leg and see that that leg comes in like it's supposed to, but then the other leg also comes in, which is a sign of hyperactive reflexes. So this is just a picture of some muscle atrophy. So you can see wasting around the shoulder girdle area, wasting of the hand muscles, which is pretty common. Both of this, the first web space, but also the thumb is commonly affected. And then atrophy of the tongue. So as I said, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is characterized by upper and lower motor neuron findings. Um, if those upper and lower motor neuron findings are restricted to the bulbar segment, um, we call that progressive bulbar palsy. Some patients just have progressive upper motor neuron degeneration and we call that primary lateral sclerosis. And some patients just have purely lower motor neuron signs that we call that progressive muscular atrophy. So as a group, they're motor neuron disease, but there are these sort of subpopulations. So to make the diagnosis, there are certain diagnostic criteria that have been established. And for a long time, we've been using the L escorial criteria. And this comes back to what I was talking about, about these four segments because through the l escorial criteria, to have definite ALS, you have to have upper motor neuron findings and lower motor neuron findings in three different regions. I already said the thoracic level doesn't have upper motor neuron findings. So then you have to have upper motor neuron findings in the bulbar, cervical, and lumbar regions, which is pretty tough, especially if you're trying to diagnose it early, as well as lower motor neuron findings in those regions. According to the criteria, you, 
to you have probable ALS, not definite ALS, if there's upper motor neuron findings and lower motor neuron findings in two regions. So although these criteria are very sensitive, specific, sorry, they're not very sensitive. And so unfortunately, you can die of ALS without actually ever meeting the criteria for definite ALS. Um, which is so, which makes them not as helpful clinically, um, but are more research criteria, but also pretty restrictive even for research uh, studies. So in 2015, they actually changed or they proposed new criteria. So for the Gold Coast criteria, you have progressive upper and lower motor neuron involvement in at least one limb or body region, so it could be just the arm with spasticity and atrophy. So upper motor neuron findings and lower motor neuron findings in just one segment. Or lower motor ne neuron deficits uh, in two regions of the body. So it's really quite a change in, in, uh, in diagnostic criteria. Having said that, you do absolutely have to exclude another disease process that's causing uh, this weakness. So what other disease process would you be trying needing to exclude or think of? So one of the most important is a cervical myelopathy. So if you compress the spinal cord, you're going to have upper motor neuron findings. So the motor tracks are going to be affected in the spinal cord. But also, if you really compress the spinal cord at that level, you may also get the motor neurons at that level. So you'll have lower motor neuron findings and upper motor neuron findings. So that's why imaging, uh, especially of the spine, but also of the brain is very important in ALS. Other things that can just cause upper motor neuron findings are vitamin B12 deficiency, copper deficiency, some infections like HIV and HTLV. The lower motor neuron findings is the trickiest thing in order to make sure that you're not dealing with some other treatable condition. Um, and so that's where um, the EMG comes in very helpful because we can see, is this just these motor neurons deteriorating or is there a problem with the actual nerve? Do we see that the nerve is actually conducting electricity slowly? And because there are immune mediated nerve problems like CIDP and multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block, which potentially can look like ALS with weakness and wasting, but are actually treatable conditions. In terms of people that present with just bulbar symptoms, uh, we think about myasthenia, although usually it's we can differentiate that clinically, but myasthenia can also present with trouble swallowing and speaking. And this other condition called spinal bulbar atrophy is something to look out for, Kennedy's disease. It is a motor neuron condition, and it is characterized by atrophy of the tongue and fasciculations that looks exactly like ALS. And it can also be characterized by muscle weakness in the arms and legs. Uh, but some differences include no upper motor neuron findings and often some sensory neuropathy. And the main reason that it's important to differentiate it from ALS is that the prognosis is much different. So they have nearly normal life expectancy. So it is definitely an important diagnosis to me. How does the EMG fit in the diagnosis? Well, I already said it's helpful to make sure there's no nerve problem or neuropathy that would be potentially treatable. It actually can help us look for evidence of lower motor neuron dysfunction that we're not seeing on our clinical examination. So sometimes we can detect fasciculations or fibrillations that indicate lower motor neuron dysfunction that we don't necessarily see in the form of muscle weakness or atrophy. And we can also test the paraspinal muscles to get that thoracic lower motor neuron dysfunction, whereas we can't always see that very well clinically. Uh, it's also helpful to rule out myasthenia and it's helpful to rule out a myopathy. The MRI is mostly done to exclude a mass or a multiple sclerosis or something like that that's causing the symptoms. But in or minority of cases, there can be actually abnormalities on the MRI that are consistent with or suggestive of ALS. For example, on T2-weighted imaging, you can see this hyperintensity or this um, 
high signal, which reflects Wallerian degeneration or just neurodegeneration of that upper motor neuron. You can also get what was called a motor band sign, which is this iron deposition in the motor cortex, um, uh, which can be seen in ALS or um, PLS. So I talked a bit about prognosis with spinal bulbar atrophy, but what's the prognosis with ALS? So usually uh, the life expectancy is on average between three and five years. So 50% of people survive three years after the diagnosis, but 20% of people survive more than five years after the diagnosis. So there is a significant chunk that survives longer than five years. And then there's a small group that survives even more than 10 years after the diagnosis. So we always have to be a bit um, careful about, about the prognosis. There are certain things that affect the prognosis. So spinal onset ALS tends to progress a bit more quickly than the limb onset. Uh, progressive muscular atrophy, like a pure lower motor neuron presentation, seems to progress a little bit more slowly. And the primary lateral sclerosis really does seems to be quite different and progresses much more slowly than the, than the other types. One of the biggest predictors for progression, though, is how people have progressed to that point. So their rate of progression, their rate of change, you know, prior to the diagnosis or prior to when you're making the prognosis, is the biggest predictor for what that progression will be for that person going forward. Uh, for, it also depends on age at onset. So for younger people, they survive longer. So um, the median survival for people that were diagnosed less than 55 years of age, median survival is over five years. Whereas if people are diagnosed at over 74 years of age, the median survival is less than three years. Um, so younger people survive longer than older people. And we already talked about limb onset rather than bulbar onset. Some of the really big breakthroughs that have happened in recent years in ALS are the identification of specific genetic mutations. So the SOD mutation was identified in the 19, early 1990s and then nothing happened for years and years until all of a sudden around 2010, there was an explosion of, of, of genetic um, genes that were identified as causing ALS. Uh, and one of the big ones was C9 or uh, 72, which is diagnosed in 2011 or so. And that now accounts for 40% of genetic ALS. The SOD mutation, which has been around known for ages, actually only accounts for 10% of genetic ALS. And there are other genes that have also been identified. Having said that, usually still, uh, ALS is sporadic. So usually most people don't have a family history, don't have an identifiable gene um, that is associated with their disease. But there is a group of people that seem sporadic, they don't have a family history, but still we can identify some of these genetic mutations in those people. One of the benefits of having the genes being identified is that it does give us some insight into the pathophysiology of ALS. And so with the C9, ORF, TDP, and FUS, we're becoming more aware that part of the pathophysiology seems to be impaired RNA processing and the accumulation of abnormal proteins. But there, we don't know the whole story. So there's lots of theories as to what happens to produce ALS and probably some complex combination of a variety of factors. So free radical formation has been a thought for a long time based on this SOD1 mutation, which uh, enhances free radical formation, excitotoxicity for excessive glutamate. Inflammation has been uh, postulated for a long time. However, all sorts of trials of anti-inflammatory medications have not been effective in ALS. Uh, deranged neural filaments, those little components of axons that make up the motor neuron, the mitochondrial toxicity, the major energy generator of the cell. Maybe there's some problem with those 
furnaces of the cell that is impairing energy and causing cell death, or maybe some abnormal apoptosis, the normal death mechanism for, for neurons. So we don't really know, it's complicated. Uh, and so it's hard to say exactly what causes ALS. We don't really know at this point. However, uh, we have made some progress in developing therapies to modify the um, progression of ALS. Um, and there are now four therapies on the market that for slowing disease progression, although we certainly do not have a cure at this point. So the first one was really is all, the second one on the market was a Daravone, the third one is sodium phenylbutyrate combined with torosodiol or albioza. And the last one is toferson, which is only for patients with an identified SOD1 mutation. So really is all has been around the longest. It was came to market in about 1997 after a couple of studies that demonstrated benefit. Uh, and specifically at 18 months, it reduced the chances of, of death or um, ventilation through uh, artificial ventilation through tracheostomy um, by about 30%, which translated to about a three month extension of life expectancy. So not huge, but some benefit. And that has shown up in other subsequent trials to be a benefit. Maybe if it started early, maybe even extends life a little six months or maybe even longer. The second one on the market was a Daravone, initially approved as an IV therapy, but now available as an oral therapy based on this study, uh, which showed a reduction in functional decline. So it, they're looking at the ALS FRS, which is a standardized score of symptoms, and it showed that it reduced the decline in patients that were on a Daravone. So patients on placebo, their ALS FRS score reduced by 7.5, whereas the, the Adaravone group reduced their ALS score by only, uh, ALS FRS by only five. So again, not a huge difference. They both are progressively getting worse, but the Adaravone group was getting less progressively worse. Unfortunately, in January of 2024, there was another study, European study, done with oral Adaravone. Now, this is a slightly different formulation than the one that's been approved. But nevertheless, during their 48-week period of study, there was no benefit in, um, in motor function with the Adaravone compared to the placebo group. So this is now raising a lot of questions about Adaravone and how effective it is. Uh, the next medication that was approved is Albrioza, and it was approved on the basis of this phase two trial, which showed again, uh, reduction in the decline of the ALS FRS. Um, so the ALS FRS got worse by 1.66 points per month with placebo and got worse by 1.24 points per month with the Albrioza. And this just in, as of March 8, 2024, there was a big phase three randomized controlled trial that was just completed uh, and showed that the Albrioza was not effective in um, reducing disability or any of the primary or secondary outpoints. Uh, and so at this point, it is being recommended that patients stop Albrioza. It wasn't shown to be dangerous. However, it just really wasn't shown to be effective. Finally, uh, Toversin is um, available, but again, only for the small group of patients with an SOD1 mutation. It is an antisense oligonucleotide therapy to downregulate or silence SOD1. It's given intrathecally, so it's a big, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, so into the spinal fluid every other week for three times and then monthly after that. 
interestingly, it was approved. However, it did not actually show clinical benefit in the in the trial. It did show an improvement in the concentration of this chemical, this neurofilament-like chain. Um, but anyway, that's another therapy that's available. I just don't, obviously you don't wanna memorize this slide, but I just wanna point out that these medications uh, have been approved for exceptional access, but each has its own little specific, specific idiosyncrasies in terms of how long people are allowed to have had symptoms, what their pulmonary function has to be, uh, how well they do on their FRS uh, score. Um, so I think I'm not going to dwell on that. They, these last two medications, the Adirovone and Albrioza, are supposed to re enhance mitochondrial function, whereas the Riliazole reduces glutamate toxicity. So their mechanisms are a bit different. So part of the theory was maybe combining these medications would have some additional benefit, but we don't have any data on that. Um, so given the limited efficacy of these medications, the main treatment is actually symptomatic treatment in ALS. And one of the mainstays of that treatment is a multidisciplinary team. In Ottawa, we have the multidisciplinary ALS clinic. And basically, there are multidisciplinary clinics all over Canada, United States, um, which really compose a whole team of individuals, including neurologists, physiatrists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, social work, nurse managers, respiratory therapists, and respiratory physicians, and dietitians. And more recently, uh, more and more palliative care physicians are also being incorporated into these multidisciplinary teams. And as of 2020 or so, we have, um, now have palliative care physicians integrated into our, our Ottawa multidisciplinary ALS team. Um, I'm just gonna stop there to ask if there's any questions about the diagnosis or treatment part. So Christine, I was wondering, ooh, that sounds not very good, sorry. Um, what is kind of the typical like how do people access the healthcare system for a diagnosis of ALS? So they imagine they present to their primary care provider for a symptom, um, then would they be referred to any neurologist or they get referred to a specific ALS neurologist or how does that work? <laughs> well, I guess it depends where you live. So usually probably patients will present to their family doctor. It's not something people present to the eMERGE for because it's sort of insidious actually uh, and progressive over uh, you know weeks to months. And then the family doctor, you know, I ideally would refer them to a neuromuscular uh, physician. And here we have, there's myself and Dr. Breiner who are more specializing in ALS. Um, so in the Ottawa area, that would be uh, a good way for patients to enter the system. Uh, but they could be referred to a neurologist in general uh, sometimes it's not, you know, even the family doctor's not really suspecting it. They might have a foot drop or they just have some hand weakness. Um, and so they would just be referred to a neurologist. And then often that neurologist will then refer them to a neuromuscular specialist. One of the people in the chat just said, you know, challenge for people who don't have a family doctor. Um, and a follow-up, what are the wait times to see a neuro neuromuscular neurologist for um... ALS? So we do triage the referrals. So those patients are actually triaged uh, so that they're seen within a month or two. Okay. Another question that came up in the chat was um, what, and I imagine this is a real, it depends and it varies across people, but what level of functionality or quality of life to people who survive more than five to 10 years after diagnosis tend to have? <laughs> um, that is a hard question. Um, I mean, usually people are pretty affected by five years, but quality of life is always a subjective uh, assessment. So, I mean, usually people are 
have some significant disability by five years. So like they'd be wheel, wheelchair bound and that kind of thing? Yeah, again, it does depend on the presentation. So if it's really swallowing problems and speech problems, they probably have a peg tube by that point. But mm -hmm. if it presented with leg symptoms, they probably are in a wheelchair by that point. But it it is an important point because it is a very variable disease. Uh, people, again, can have a lot of bulbar symptoms and then really not much weakness in the legs. And the opposite is also true. Um, so it quite can be quite varied. Thank you. So we'll move on to the palliative care piece, but um, before we do, um, we have a question. Um, so what percentage of people uh, with motor neuron disease receive palliative care in their last year of life, do you think? This is in Ontario. You can't vote says on the sheet. Are you going to let me know when to go on? Yeah, for sure. It uh, looks like most people have answered. Just going to give another moment here. We'll get in some more coming. Okay, I think that should be good. So I'll share the results here. It's quite um, wow, it's it, it's a three-way tie there between forty-four percent, sixty-six percent, and thirty-five percent. So there, yeah, okay. So it's not an obvious answer, that's for sure. Um, I'm gonna. So the answer is forty-four percent, which is a bit shocking um, because this is a known neurodegenerative condition. Uh, you know, with a very fixed timeline. Uh, so one would think this would be a perfect um, population for palliative care. But in this study that we did back in 2019, looking at um, data from like healthcare system data from the province of Ontario, only 44% of patients actually saw a palliative uh, physician in the, in the last year of life. So not even in the last, you know, two or three or four years, but in the last year of life, uh, they did only 44 saw a palliative care physician, which is larger than people without ALS, but nevertheless, um, perhaps not as much as many would expect. Um, if looking in that last year of life for patients with ALS, they were more likely to spend time in the ICU, they were thankfully more likely to receive home care uh, than other people, which would be understandable because they are likely to have a significant disability at that time. The other really interesting thing was that if they did see a palliative care physician, they were much less likely to die in hospital and presumably more likely to die in home or hospice, which may be more preferable for them. So, I am going to turn it over to those palliative care specialists. Well, I'm changing it, changing of the guard. So, <laughs> um, hi everybody. Um, I have to figure out how to change the button. So, because um, motor presentation is the most common. Uh, presentation for ALS, we decided to put the motor case first. We are going to talk about the other symptoms as we go. So don't worry uh, if we haven't got to them all. Um, we're going to do some slightly different presentations. And this is partly to speak, may speak a little bit to that question about, well, how do people access health care with this type of illness? And one of the things what when I was first starting to learn about ALS, when I discovered that most people had symptoms for more than a year or often had symptoms for more than a year before they were diagnosed. And when you start looking at some of these pathways and the fact that um, it can be subtle, um, it sort of starts to explain that. So I sort of present a case which is fairly typical to what I see when I talk to people in terms of how they present it. So Ms. Weak Grip is a 56 year old. She's right handed. Um, she's got a, adult children. She's divorced and lives on her own, works for the government. And I put those things in because one of the things with ALS is we start to think about if people are getting weaker, if people are having more motor function and other health issues, 
well, how likely are they going to be able to access services? What are the resources that they're going to have? So if people live alone, there are very different implications. If they have access to insurance, there may, that may open some other opportunities. So starting to um, think about some of those issues that are real, um, really relevant for the day-to-day -day, uh, quality of life for patients. So she started to get some cramps in her right hand when she was lifting something heavy or when she was doing things, her hand would cramp up, but she kind of do what we all do is sort of shake it out when, when our muscles cramp up and she went on and kind of ignore it and, and it would go away. And then she noticed, you know, a little while later, she was starting to have a little trouble opening, you know, opening jars. Her hand felt a little bit weak, but she'd been able to do all her otherwise normal things. Um, so she thought, well, I'm on the computer a lot. I read a lot. She'd read a lot, you know, heard about carpal tunnel syndrome and patients aren't neurologists. <laughs> and some things which may be very evident to people like doctors Wicker, even to me trained as a family doctor, you know, I wouldn't automatically be worried about it. And a lot of patients aren't. So she went on Amazon, which you can now do and order a carpal tunnel splint. She thought, okay, well, I'll try that for a little while um, and put on the carpal tunnel slip. And then a couple of months later, she's, she's an active person, always goes to the gym. And she's starting to have trouble lifting weights that had never been a problem before. And again, same with this arm, the same with the right, same right arm as before. So she's starting to get a little bit worried about it. And she has a doctor, um, fortunately. She goes to her family doctor and he does notice that, you know, she has weakness in the right hand and her arm and the reflexes in that limb are a little, uh, seem a little bit brisk, but the rest of the exam was pretty normal. So for those of you who, you know, maybe work in a primary care office, with, with a presentation like that, would you jump to the concept of a motor neuron disease. You're a little sensitized now because we've been talking about it. <laughs> Try to imagine how you would have felt yesterday. Okay, give it another moment here. So it looks like 76% of people are saying they need more information and tests first. So there, there are a few people who are thinking immediately going there. And, and I mean, it's, and a lot of people, and in hindsight, I have a lot of people say, well, it crossed my mind or, you know, the doctor said it could be something else. Um, so sometimes, you know, yes, but people tend not to jump right to something particularly as serious as ALS. And that's often not mentioned to the patient at, at first presentation with something subtle like this. Um, but yeah, a lot of people say, oh, this is a little bit worrying. Um, she's definitely got weakness. Something's going on. So you wouldn't probably just get sent home. Um, but um, people often don't jump uh, right away to ALS. Um, do I have control of the slides? Just click on the slide deck oh, end. sorry. <laughs> there we go. So there we go. Sorry, minor technical issue. So this isn't an exhaustive link, but when you think about it, when someone's got an, a limb that's weak, we sort of work through that. Well, okay, where is this coming from? Is it coming from the brain? Is it coming from the spine? Is it coming from one of the peripheral nerves? Is it coming from the link between the nerve and the muscle? Um, so there's all sorts of places between us having a thought and a muscle having to do something where things can go wrong. And so really early on, some of these things have a pretty broad list of things that we might sort of be trying to think about or rule out. Um, and so it's obvious, often not really obvious and people don't go straight to, I need to send them to a, you know, a neuromuscular, a neurologist. People are still trying to work through a fairly big, um, set of complicated possibilities for this. Um, and this lady, you know, when she when they were talking to her, she had some back pain and neck pain. And so they thought, okay, well, maybe this is coming, as it sort of said, from the cervical spine or something like that. She has some degenerative changes in an x-ray that we've done for another cause. So the doctor thought, okay, well, maybe this is that cervical spine, um, like stenosis or uh, nerve compression in her spine. So sent her to physiotherapy, but did order the MRI. 
But for anyone who's tried to access some, an MRI, particularly through primary care, the wait for that can be pretty substantial. Um, so they sort of, doctors sort of said, start the physiotherapy, I've ordered the MRI and will, and then let me know if things are changing. So she went back and carried on kind of as normal for a while, but the physio wasn't getting any better. Uh, it was getting harder to do some of her day-to-day -day cat things like working on her computer. She was having a little bit of coordination problem. She was having more trouble managing her dog when she wanted to walk her dog. And then she was out hiking and she tripped and um, had also noticed she was having trouble climbing the stairs and sort of noticed that her foot was sort of falling and she couldn't control it properly, especially later in the day. So she went back to her family doctor and said, you said to come back if things were getting worse. And he diagnosed this a left foot drop. And there's kind of a picture of what a foot, a foot drop is if you haven't seen one. And they're relatively common. And all of us and the doctor got much more worried because now she had both an arm problem and a leg problem and did an urgent referral to neurology and sought to see if he could get the MRI um, expedited. Um, fortunately, as uh, Drs. Wicker said, here in Ottawa, we have relatively ready access to neurology. Um, so she got a fairly prompt assessment um, and the EMG testing and was diagnosed with probable ALS. Now, one of the things that I sort of talked about where very early on in the diagnosis of, of patients with ALS or other motor neuron disease, we start thinking about what could happen because we know they're progressive. And when we think about disability, we often think of a kind of a linear thing where, you know, you cane and then you need a walker and then you might need a wheelchair. And then you might maybe someday need an electric wheelchair. But with ALS, because where it affects in the body is unpredictable, we often don't get this trajectory. So if you see people who have very weak arms, if they get any weakness in their legs at all, they can't use a cane, they can't use a walker, at least not very easily. Um, so some of the, or they may have opposite, you know, a left leg and a right arm. So some of the patterns of mobility aids um, may not be very predictable. And it really needs that individual sort of monitoring and care plan that we get with an interdisciplinary team. That's why that is so important. Because while we, it's predictable that the illness will progress, the pattern of the progression is very individual. And Dr. Zwicker was talking about that. Each person I've met in over the last 20 years, I've met a lot of people now with ALS. Um, each person's illness is their own. The pattern is their own. Um, the speed of progression is their own. And you see every kind of combination of symptoms. So I've seen people per completely paralyzed, but with no breathing or swallowing problems. I've seen people who can walk, who have terrible breathing and swallowing problems, who are very dependent on respiratory support. So there's a lot of variability. Um, and so it can be an issue. So access to some equipment actually has time or life expectancy rules. And that can make access complicated. And if people don't have funds to privately fund them, they need to go through those processes. And that can be slow. Um, and so it can make it much, much more complicated. So this steady monitoring, regular assessment, regular um, involvement of occupational phys phys and physiotherapy is so critical for this population so that you can not only manage what symptoms they're having now, but by testing and monitoring, start to anticipate what they're gonna need as the next step so that you don't aren't always running behind or, and chasing to catch up. Um, so she wants to keep going to the gym and is asking about the role of exercise. And should she be um, still exercising? So they have done quite a bit of research on this and there is benefit from exercise. Um, and this question is benefit for all of the, or the, all of the things except one of the above for your poll. So which thing does it not help? Hello. 
So, yeah, although this isn't a completely option, and part of this is depending on what time period you're looking at, because we know over time they still do lose function and they still uh, may uh, lose, um, have changes in their FBC and muscle. Um, it doesn't improve survival, but it does slow or in some cases potentially give some gain, um, some benefit um, to the other, other factors. So it is uh, beneficial uh, for people to continue to exercise. Now, there are some caveats for that. So they, I found a meta-analysis of seven, study, seven studies from 2020 and 10 studies from 2021. So this is an ongoing field of study um, that did compare sort of either passive, just range of motion to preserve joint mo mobility um, and usual care to a more prescribed exercise regimen um, through physiotherapy. Um, and overall, as I said, did show the benefit, can help slow deterioration of musculature, can help maintain function using the ALF SRS scores, which I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about, and it can improve the FEC without improving survival. Um, usually they used a combination of strength and strength or endurance and aerobic exercise. One of the caveats is that there's a limit to this. Um, a study that did compared a moderate intensity about twice a week, 60 minutes, and a five times a week, so is more better, they actually found that the group with the five times a week did it worse than the sedentary group. So there is a sense that if, if the neurological damage is al already happening, you actually can weaken and fatigue more quickly. So it's, always, it's a bit of a balance of overwork um, to later work. So patients who report that they lose function as the day goes on, you may suggest they not do vigorous activity you know, for an extended time in the morning, because that may actually start to impair their function later in the day. So it's a bit of a balance of maintaining activity as much as possible. Early in the disease maybe is better because you can strengthen the muscles that are still healthy and aren't having the neurological illness so that they have more reserve um, as injury occurs. So it is again important to be um, individualize the approaches and the treatment to the patient's abilities and also what their goals are, what they wanna be able to do. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about the AF or F ALS FRS, but we don't, I didn't include the whole um, part here, but the part related to motor function, we actually monitor each time we see people in clinic and at, sort of check changes in that. And again, where we're starting to see changes can help us plan for what they may need in the future. And amongst the categories that, that are included are things like handwriting, cutting food and handling utensils, very practical things, getting dressed and doing personal care, turning in bed and adjusting blankets, things we don't often think, wouldn't obviously think of being an issue, as well as walking and climbing stairs. And the score ranges from normal um, to zero, which they can't do that activity anymore with obviously with steps in between. So if we're starting to see changes in that, then we can say, uh oh, they're starting to have some trouble getting dressed. They're starting to need some assistance with um, cutting food and can start to plan. There are elements in the ALS FRS for swallowing, respiratory changes, um, other things as well. And I just wanted to include, now the lady in, the, in this picture is a real patient and she was actually quite happy to have her picture included. I said, I can take a picture of your, of your equipment without you including. She says, no, 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 I like to, to be involved in teaching. And this is showing um, one of the setups for a patient with ALS who uses a motorized wheelchair. You can see it has a joystick. She has her mouthpiece ventilation, which Dr. Watt is gonna talk about, um, attached to the chair. So she's actually quite independent um, with her a motorized wheelchair at this point. Um, but you sort of see the specialist ch specialized setup. Uh, on the other side, we have some things like uh, lifts, um, special uh, sit to stand lifts if you can hold on, but if your legs are weak, uh, different things like that that people often need. And amazingly for managing the motorized wheelchair in addition to the joystick, um, there are special ones that people can't use their fingers, but they can move their arm. The upper picture is a hand one. Um, or even mechanisms for people control with their feet. And similarly, there are many adaptive tools for electronic communication, for eating, um, that really with the goal of trying to keep people as independent um, as long as they possibly can be. And uh, many patients with these things uh, can continue to be independent for quite a long time. And I'm gonna switch to Dr. Watt. <laughs> oh, there may be, if there are questions, I guess I can stick around. Yeah. 
Sorry, guys. Um, so there's a few things that kind of come up in the in the chat. So, um, and it kind of links between Dr. Zicker's material and, and yours, Jill. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a sense of how accepting are patients and families of having palliative care involved in their care? And then um, do, you, do you feel like we have more folks who are being seen by palliative care earlier in their disease trajectory? Yeah, well, we did a study just to that effect. So Dr. Zwick or Dr. Watts going to speak to that because it was yeah. her baby. <laughs> well, we were really lucky to be able to do a study and had a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people from the uh, multidisciplinary ALS clinic be involved. Um, and essentially what we did was we offered palliative care consults to everybody with uh, everybody that was coming to the clinic and their caregivers, at, regardless of what phase they were in their illness, regardless of how long they'd had ALS. Um, and the uptake was actually really impressive. Everybody that got um, a palliative care consult, when we asked them how they felt about it, everybody said it was helpful. Everybody said that they would recommend it. Everybody said that they... Um, uh, that they would have wanted it either at the time that they had it or earlier in, in their illness. Nobody, even the people that we were seeing in the first, you know, their first visit or their second visit to the ALS clinic said that they, they thought it would be appropriate for later. Um, so it was really nice, uh, really nice for us to see. And we're happy to be in the process of publishing a lot of those results. So everybody can look them up. So I imagine, you're pro are you probably looking at location of care at the end of life as well as one of those outcomes or... Uh, we're, well, we will eventually be with these patients, um, but uh, I know that um, Dr. Wicker's study did look at that um, for the Ontario data of location of, of death. Because there was a question about um, the number of deaths that happen at home, and is that influenced again by the resources that are available to support somebody through to end of life at home? Yeah, so <clears throat> it looks like the deaths at home are more in a, actually more in an urban population than a rural population. I was sort of one of the predictors of uh, death in hospital was being in a rural setting. All right. Um, sorry, and I was just gonna chime in on that one because one of the predict things I found too is really the access to personal resources because people need a lot of help. Um, mm -hmm. And so people who live alone, um, it's virtually impossible for them. Um, people with limited financial resources often can't access enough help through the public system. So unfortunately, people have large families who can sort of chip in, share. they're more likely to be able to manage home or people who are highly resourced. Um, otherwise, it can be very challenging because needs can be over a long period of time. So caregivers get really tired um, and is often quite resource intention, be, intensive because the equipment and the needs change over time and it does add up quite a lot. Thanks. All right, so we'll move on. Um, and we're going to start right away with a poll. We're going to talk a little bit about Mr. B. Um, so Mr. B is a 61-year-old gentleman. Um, he has bulbar ALS that was diagnosed about 18 months ago. Um, and you see him and he's complaining of morning headaches and orthopnea. Um, he has no short of breath, he tells you during the day. He's His FVC, so his vital capacity on his last um, pulmonary testing was 71%, so okay. Um, the question is, what is the best management? Christine, I wonder if it would help to just read out some of those acronyms, because we do probably have a little bit of a mixed audience. Absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So the question is, um, or the the options are in, in initiation of non-invasive ventilation. So that would be um, BiPAP. Overnight oximetry. So looking at the oxygen level overnight. Um, non-invasive ventilation and G-tube insertion. So um, like a, a feeding tube. Or uh, repeating pulmonary function tests. So PFTs in three months. Okay, I think that answers are slowing down now. So I'll share the results here. And it looks like about 44% are saying overnight oximetry and 39% initiation of NIV 
Okay. So the answer here is initiation of non-invasive ventilation. Um, we're going to kind of talk through a, a bunch of different symptoms of bulbar ALS pretty quickly in this talk um, because that could be a talk all on its own. Um, so uh, we're going to immediately jump to the respiratory section. So uh, patients with bulbar, bulbar ALS are, are quite uh, prone to respiratory insufficiency or problems with their breathing. Usually those are problems due to hypoventilation. So the actual muscles that they have that are helping them take a deep breath aren't working as well. Can lead to um, shortness of breath and dyspnea. Can lead to fatigue. Sometimes even people are complaining of like insomnia. Um, and a lot of the times people are complaining of um, early morning headaches and that's because of hypercapnia. So high CO2 levels overnight. Usually, and this is not always, um, you're not needing to supplement oxygen um, because it's not really an oxygen problem. Oxygen can go into the lungs and go across into the bloodstream normally. It's not a problem with the, oxy like, um, the oxygen transferring, um, but it's actually that they're not breathing and I'm not able to take as much uh, air in. So you can do a lot of different testing. Our, our patients often will see um, uh, the great respiratory therapists um, and they'll do a whole bunch of testing, but uh, really, uh, when they're starting to have symptoms of either dyspnea, orthopnea, morning headaches, those kinds of things, um, those are indications for starting non-invasive ventilation, at least at night. Um, and I put up two different uh, screenshots of two different guidelines here, um, both that are saying, you know, you don't need to wait for a specific number, even the symptoms are, are enough to, to be able to initiate uh, non-invasive ventilation. There's a lot of things that are available to the patients um, that can help with, um, with uh, respiratory insufficiency. Um, and one of those things is lung volume, uh, lung volume recruitment. So if anybody's ever seen this before, it's quite cool. Um, I'm gonna play a video. Lung volume recruitment with a modified manual resuscitation bag. The yeah. LVR bag is used yeah. to assist with breath stacking yeah. beyond that which yeah. an individual can achieve yeah. on their own up to maximum insufflation capacity. Routine lung volume recruitment with the LVR yeah. bag benefits individuals with neuromuscular diseases, spinal cord injury, or muscular <sighs> skeletal conditions. Okay, so you can imagine that that's kind of like overinflating the lungs. Um, or not overinflating the lungs to what they're able to do, but um, helping the person take a bigger, bigger breath than what they're able to do. Um, and that can help with uh, a lot of different things. It can help them feel less short of breath. It can help them uh, with any atelectasis they may have or collapsing of the lung bases from not being fully uh, blown up um, and lots of other different things. I see a question in the chat says, how do we access non-invasive ventilation? So um, ideally it would be through your multidisciplinary uh, clinic. Um, here in Ottawa, that would definitely be the way um, through uh, RTs or even community-based RTs, I think, can help with that. Another uh, tool that sometimes we'll see used is a cough assist. So this is uh, for people who are having some muscle weakness. A lot of the time it's like in their um, uh, bulbar muscles that are making it difficult for them to cough or to clear any secretions. Uh, essentially what it does is it gives you um, positive air in, kind of like an overly large deep breath, and then pulls all that air out quickly and kind of shifts the air quickly. Um, and so I have another video to show you. I, I always preface this with, um, this is showing the Cough Assist T70. I do not necessarily By recommend By simulating a one. natural cough, a Cough Assist T70 is an effective, comfortable way to help clear the airway. It gradually delivers a large volume of air to the lungs, similar to a deep breath, then quickly reverses the airflow to pull secretions out. And so just to, to kind of give everybody a quick primer on what non-invasive ventilation is, um, so there are kind of two options. There's CPAP, which you've heard of a lot. A lot of people with sleep apnea use it. it stands for continuous positive airway pressure. So that's um, like always you put, you put your CPAP mask on and then you're always having the same amount kind of being pushed in uh, at the same time. Whereas BiPAP or bi-level um, positive airway pressure, it kind of gives you two different pressures, makes sense with the name, where it kind of simulates more of like an inhale and an exhale. Um, and the patient kind of initiates those breaths, but if they stop initiating those breaths, you can't actually have like a backup respiratory rate. 
And if you've uh, seen patients with ALS, you see that not all BiPAP masks or um, non-invasive ventilation masks are created equal. Uh, there's lots of different options for them. Um, and that's fantastic because sometimes the pattern of muscle wasting is, um, is different. It's hard for them to keep a proper seal on if they're, they're losing uh, muscle mass in their cheeks. Uh, sometimes people can feel really claustrophobic and they need like a bigger, uh, a bigger window. Um, and sometimes it's just a little bit of manipulation to get the right fit. And so that's why it's uh, super, super important to, um, to include your, your RTs uh, in the community or in the multidisciplinary clinic as much as possible. They're the experts on that. So uh, Dr. Rice showed us um, a picture of uh, our lovely lady that had a mouthpiece ventilation. Mouthpiece ventilation is something that we use sometimes. Um, it's essentially allowing for uh, non-invasive ventilation, but without actually a mask on your face. So it's this little piece here um, that you close your mouth around and it gives you that kind of positive airway um, pressure. Um, the big thing with this is it requires you to have the ability to actually make a seal over the airpiece. So somebody who has a lot of muscle wasting in their cheeks or things like that may not actually be able to have mouthpiece, mouthpiece ventilation um, because they're not able to kind of keep that seal. This is really helpful in somebody where if you've had a lot of BiPAP on, sometimes you have like skin breakdown from the masks and those kinds of things, or people who are feeling really claustrophobic from a BiPAP, uh, this can be a good option. We also see a lot of dyspnea um, in our patients with respiratory insufficiency. Um, I'm when you get to the point where dyspnea is symptomatic and you've optimized BiPAP as much as you can, uh, at that point, we often will talk about uh, starting a small, low dose of opioids um, just to kind of reduce some of that air hunger. We usually use morphine as our first line. You can go as low as one milligram, um, kind of as needed or on a PRN basis. Uh, sometimes we also give midazolam if we're having distress or people are, are prone to like a crisis or a dyspnea crisis. Um, again, wanting to start that really low and, and carefully. As a, like a third, third line, sometimes we use methotrimeprazine or nosenin, but usually that's mostly in the kind of the more end of life period. Okay, we're gonna shift away from respiratory. I told you we were gonna go pretty quick. Um, and I have another poll for you. So now we have Mr. B, um, his partner is voicing concerns that he's losing some weight. Uh, he's now eating just soft foods and he's washing them down with fluids. He's lost about 5% of his weight in the last three months. Um, but he's not choking. And you see Mr. Bean, he kind of tells you, and I've heard this a lot, like, oh, I'm open to a G2, but I want to wait until it's absolutely required. Um, would you recommend that he have a G2 at this time? Okay, so it's a little split here, but 55% hey, you know, of people okay. saying yes. Yeah, so the conversations and the indications for G-tubes are nuanced at best, and I actually don't have a right answer for you here. But I do have some indications that have been uh, identified by the Canadian ALS best practice guidelines um, as to when you would talk about G-tube insertion. So um, that would be increased risk of aspiration despite modification. So he's not choking yet, but there definitely is an increased risk. Um, if he's having to like wash all of his food down with water or with other liquids, you kind of start to get a little worried. It says five to 10% weight loss. He was kind of in the 5% category. Um, if they're starting to see drops in BMI, I didn't give you a BMI, so that's not really fair um, for you to be able to decide. Um, if uh, the total energy output exceeds intake. So if I, I often will talk to, to patients and say, you know, you're spending a lot of your time and energy just trying to get calories in. Um, and that often can almost be counterintuitive. They start losing weight because of that. And then the last one is um, if their vital capacity is about 50% of baseline. So often when you start seeing the, the vital capacity go down, it's a sign that the respiratory um, muscles aren't working as well. And you want to, put a G-tube in early, even if there's no issues with swallowing, um, largely because it's less risky for anesthesia. So that's why that indication is there. Uh, practically, I've seen people start recommending G-tubes a little bit earlier than 50%, but um, that's, that's what the guidelines are saying. So there's no right or wrong answer here, but it's something that I definitely would have brought up with our friend, Mr. B.
I do often end up talking about malnutrition or, or weight loss um, with these patients. And, and often it's related to, you know, inability to swallow, um, inability to take PO easily. Um, but then there's also this idea that maybe there's some component of like hypermetabolism, similar to like a cancer cachexia type syndrome. It's, it's kind of hypothesized. Um, when you do have a G-tube um, and G-tube insertion, it prolongs ALS survival. The literature says by three to six months. I think, you know, we've definitely talked a lot about how depending on your pattern of change, it could be, you know, three to six months. It could be, you know, a year if you're if you're a primarily bulbar case and swallowing is your major issue. Um, you definitely could have a lot longer of a life expectancy if you are rectifying that major problem. And uh, as we are talking about with every aspect here, uh, talk to your multidisciplinary team, involve a dietitian early, talk to them often. I'm reading in the chat says, do you speak about goals of care at G-tube insertion when to stop the feeds? Not necessarily. Um, often we talk about it, we, we, we try to have goals of care conversations always. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in the talk. Um, so we will kind of have some goals of care discussions. We do talk about the fact that at some point we may want to stop feeds or we may never use the G-tube for feeds themselves. Um, particularly if we're talking about placing them because we're seeing a declining FVC and the person's like, oh, but I have no issue swallowing. What if I don't want to use a G-tube at some point in my life? We often will say, you know, you're not just because you have it, you're not committed to using it. And if, even if you use it, you're not committing it to using it forever. Um, so we do kind of touch on some of those things, but we don't usually come up with like a very clear, specific like plan as to like when we're going to use it, when we're going to stop it, because these are very fluid things. Um, so Mr. B, Mr. B is now calling us complaining of worsening secretions. His secretions are thin and he's using a napkin constantly to prevent drooling. Um, and I have some options for management here. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering what people will say. Uh, for those um, that aren't sure, QHS just means at night. Okay, so it looks like most people, 76% are saying all of the above. It's a pretty safe bet when you say all, when you have the answer of all of the above, all of the above is often <laughs> correct. Um, and, and that is the answer, all of the above. Um, there's lots and lots of different options for salary. So lots of secretions. That's a really common thing that we see in, in, um, in specifically bulbar ALS. Um, and often we're tailoring what we're choosing based on some of the desirable side, side effects that we're looking at. So Often the first line is atropine oral drops. Um, I've had some success with that, um, but usually if the person's having so many secretions that they're like pooling out of their mouth and dripping, you know, you put one drop on, it's probably going to come out with the saliva pretty quickly. Um, or you, you, it may not just be enough to kind of get that effect. Uh, we used to use scopolamine patches. Unfortunately, scopolamine patches are, are not available um, anymore. Um, Tricyclic antidepressants, so like amitriptyline, um, those are really good, especially if you're um, also trying to combat um, mood or um, some insomnia or something like that. Uh, the side effect of those medications is dry mouth. Uh, oral suctioning, so um, just kind of in the, the front of the mouth, not deep oral suctioning, but just kind of in the front of the mouth um, is something that we would use uh, often if the person's having a lot of drooling to the point that they're like, like I said, having to catch it with a cup or a napkin. And then usually later down the line, we're, we're using injectable glycopyrrolate um, that can be used on an as needed basis or um, on a regular basis if, if the person's finding it effective um, at a dose of somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4 milligrams. Yeah, some patients even less. Um, and then we are uh, now seeing a lot of patients get Botox injections into their parotid glands. Into their parotid glands. Um, that's done through neurology and uh, we refer to neurology at the Ottawa hospital to get that done. It actually has the best evidence of everything that's here. The challenge is a lot of the people are a little bit worried about it, it further impairing swallowing. Um, so sometimes it's not done until after G-tubes are placed. The other problem with it is Botox itself, the medication isn't covered. 
And I think for some people that can be a bit of a barrier. Uh, they have to purchase the Botox like outright. Radiotherapy to the product gland is a potential possibility. I've actually never seen it or used it. The other thing to think about when you're talking about secretions with a patient is, okay, are they truly like the, the thick secretions or thin secretions like uh, the sialuria, or are we talking about more thick secretions when the person saying I'm having secretions that they're having trouble clearing? You know, they're having trouble clearing those secretions and they're a bit thicker, giving them medications for thin secretions is going to make it harder for them to clear. So it's important to really figure out that distinction. So if they're fairly thick secretions and it's more of a problem if they're not able to clear them because of their muscle strength or, or something like that, um, at that point, you want to talk about like maybe using a saline nebulizer, or humidified O2, and really kind of talking about lung volume recruitment, the cough assist, chest physio, some of those things. Uh, I see a question that says, oh, hi, Amanda. Um, are there any options for community-based injections for Botox? I'm looking at Jill or Dr. Rice to see if she knows any. She not, not for parotid. Not for parotid. For other parts of the body, I've had some success, but for the yeah. parotid one, because it's very specialized. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. We've really only done it through the Ottawa hospital meeting at home. Yeah. Unfortunately, no, I think Amanda. They're worried the risk is higher of complications. So they, yeah. Yeah. With that risk of swallowing and that they, they tend to only do it in hospital. I've never seen it in the community, unfortunately. Okay. So, uh, we're meeting Mr. B now one year later and he's continuing to decline. He has a G-tube. He requires BiPAP when he's sleeping and his speech is declining and his partner is having more difficulty understanding him. And he wants to know what options are exist to help with communication. So these are all options for communication or all options for next steps. But in Mr. B's case, one wouldn't really be indicated. Okay, so uh, the most common ones with 49% of people saying starting voice banking. Yeah, okay, perfect. You guys are smart. So that is the right answer to starting voice banking. Um, voice banking is a wonderful thing if, if you've not heard of it. It's essentially um, a system where the, the person with ALS has the option to um, bank their own voice. So when they start losing the ability to communicate and they're using some other options that will speak for them, it's actually in their own voice as opposed to like a more robotic voice. The reason why it's not indicated here with Mr. B is because he's already losing his ability to speak. So he's kind of lost that window of doing the voice banking. Um, I spoke to the SLPs at the multidisciplinary clinic uh, here in Ottawa and I said, when do you, when do you suggest that we talk about that? And they said that they actually do suggest doing it very, very early in the person's illness. And it's something that comes up in one of their initial visits. Um, there's lots of options for communication. We would be here all day if I tried to stand, uh, tried to name them all. But there's some really low tech options. There's some really high tech options. Again, getting your SLPs involved really early is great. Um, and referral for some of these uh, communication strategies is really, there are cutoffs in terms of like voice tone, percent understandability and those kinds of things, but practically it's just when patients or family are noticing a change. Um, so here's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, if you have, you know, intact motor function in your hands and your arms, you're, you're able to use things like communication boards or um, button communicators, those kinds of things. Um, when the person's really starting to lose the ability to communicate, if they still have their thumbs, there's a lot of apps where they can kind of type what they're thinking and they can say the speech. Um, and then as they are losing both their motor function in their hands, they're no longer able to use some of those devices, um, as well as their speech, um, eye gaze device technology is something that we use often, which is set up to essentially, um, it's like a tablet that can read the person's eyes um, that kind of helps with that communication. And um, I'm told that it's uh, it's very actually, despite sounding very high tech, is actually quite easy to, to figure out um, and really takes in the spectrum of like a couple of hours. Okay, I'm gonna take a break and uh, Dr. Rice is gonna come back.
Are there questions on that section? Well, we've got Dr. Watt handy. I think she did a good job of keeping uh, up. She was I watching that, watching the comments as we go. Yes. Okay. So that's it. So we're actually going to start this one with a poll. That's mean because uh, we haven't even had. So the section where I was going to talk about is cognition and ALS. And we've got Mr. D who's a 64 year old newly diagnosed motor predominant ALS. He's home with his wife and adult daughter and his grandchildren. Um, retired six months ago because of more struggles managing at work. And his wife is noticing he's, you know, a bit more scattered. And she's asking us, you know, is this uh, part of his ALS? Is it just part of his routine since he retired? So his question is, what's, how likely is it that he has cognitive change potentially related to his ALS? And we didn't give you a 0% option. <laughs> Okay, so the most common result we're getting so far is 25%, and then it's kind of split between the other 3% there. Okay. Or so, three options, yeah. So the rate is actually closer to 50%. Now, when I say that, um, we often think about ALS as being an illness that doesn't affect cognition at all. And in most people, the cognitive effects are subtle. Um, so they're not like a, a full-blown dementia in most cases. Um, so about 50% can have cognitive changes. And then when they do studies, this is often present right at diagnosis. So it doesn't necessarily seem to be only later in the course of the disease. It's often present quite early. There's only what would be diagnosable as dementia, often frontotemporal dementia, but a de a, a, any form of full dementia is much rarer only in about five, but some studies show up to 15%. So cognitive impairment is relatively more common than we tend to think. And sometimes, as I said, when they're doing studies on this, they find those cognitive changes early. Um, it is important um, because if we're doing testing early after diagnosis, many people do have an adaptive a time period and they're grieving, exactly. So then they're talking about, I see that in even the comments, you could be grieving diagnosis and be overwhelmed. And it is really important to factor that in. They found that most people um, with a diagnosis like this do have that period of grief, um, those uh, sort of adaptive mood symptoms that are very common after the diagnosis and usually over time those settle. And so you do have to factor in assessing mood, especially if you're doing the tests early. And that's one of the reasons probably we don't routinely do sort of neurocognitive testing outside of studies, but it is important to be aware that these changes are early. Um, in many cases. Um, this is an older study, um, but um, in the um, sort of when they were looking at these as an amalgam of recent studies, this is one that's still used. Um, and they found that 47% had perfectly normal co cognition in this study that was done in 2012. 14% um, in that study actually met the criteria for frontotemporal dementia. So a relatively high percentage in that particular study. 21% um, had some executive dysfunction. And so again, this is, again, not, not dementia, but where they noticed some change in their executive functioning and, dis and decision-making. And then 14% had changes in other parts of their cognition, like language or memory. There were a few people, just because we're, we are working in some cases with an older population who had Alzheimer's or other types of dementia as well. Um, but loss of or impact on executive function and frontotemporal impacts are um, common. Now, one of the questions that's come up often is, well, does it matter? Does it make a difference where their symptom onset is with how likely they are to have cognitive, cognitive change? So does bulbar or respiratory effect or motor effect make any difference? I'm just making you guys answer questions left, right, and center tonight. So it looks like here we are. 
So 46% are saying yes, 41% that they don't know, and 12% no. Well, and it actually is very reasonable that this is a mixed answer because the honest truth is we're not sure. There have been some studies that suggest that there may be some higher risk with people who present with bulbar symptoms, but there have been other studies that didn't show that. So although there, you know, you often hear that it's more likely to have cognitive change with bulbar onset, um, the actual data on that is not not very clear at this point, and really. Uh, cognition is is seems to be a relatively new area of study and relatively understudied. Um, again, there are some longitudinal studies, but not very many. Um, but some longitudinal studies so again found that the symptoms were present at baseline, and one study did sort of a, a every six month follow up. And at six months, they found there'd been some progression. But if you had normal cognition at start, with only a small percentage of those actually developed changes after six months. Um, so again, thinking of it was it something that tends to happen as the disease progresses. But if you were had normal cognition at baseline, it, you know, you had reasonable chance of it not getting any worse. And then after that, they found that things didn't get worse. Unfortunately, one of the challenges in this study is it started with 186 patients, but it, by six months, there were only 98 patients. And by 12 months, there were only 46. And one of the things that it impacted on the person's ability to um, do the study was they found that patients with cognitive impairment were more likely to drop out of the study. So the studies that are following longitudinally maybe underestimate the impact of progression. Um, yeah, you're talking about how can a personal support worker know, uh, report these cognitive changes. It is really important that if a personal support worker is noticing a change to mention it, if possible, say to the visit nurse or, or home care provider, um, and also, um, or potentially sort of get a sense if the family is also noticing changes um, to have them report it to their healthcare providers. Because really we do depend on personal support workers, all the people who are coming in and out of the house to pick up the subtle changes. And unfortunately, um, I think this is overlooked in, in many more, in many cases. Um, again, the, even the studies that we've done tend to be patients who are early in the course of the disease. They had relatively high ALS FRS scores still. The follow-up is relatively shorter. And as I mentioned, the people who dropped out were the ones who had cognitive impairment. And so it makes it really hard to uh, get good studies on this. Um, we often don't do formal neurocognitive testing in patients. In fact, I would say we don't routinely do this at all unless somebody raises a concern. Um, so is there a role for more proactive screening um, and things like that, especially since it's often present at diagnosis, but recognizing as one of you commented, the, um, the mood and symptoms and things may interfere at that point. But it can be really interesting. And I've worked with a number of ALS patients who people talk about them, you know, being a bit difficult or it's hard to get them to make decisions. Um, I've had a couple of family members say, even though they were having symptoms, I couldn't get them to go to the doctor um, about what are very clearly symptoms that would, you'd think would be alarming to the patient. But I've had several families say, I couldn't get them to go to the doctor or the patient themselves said, you know, I had this problem for two years and you're thinking, was this not alarming to you? Um, and so maybe this may be partly actually um, factors of the disease early on. Talk to the family and this is, can be really helpful because often it's families who say, you know, their personality, again, it's rarely a full-blown cognitive impairment, but they say things like, well, their personality is a bit little different, or it's harder to get them to make a decision than before, or I don't quite understand how they're making decisions because that doesn't fit with how they made decisions before. So families often pick up those subtle changes that healthcare providers who, aren't, who don't know people as well may um, mix. The other thing is that it gets harder for healthcare providers, and especially now, now palliative care is getting involved earlier, um, we do often have a chance to get to know people and see them when their communication is still good. But if you're getting involved in people's care later where commun communication is more difficult, it can be hard to judge, are they com communicating in a certain way because they're struggling to communicate just because of the motor and the speech impacts or is it? are there cognitive elements that are making it hard for them to communicate? So the other symptoms of the disease can make it harder to do assessments, especially late. But this goes back to those advanced care planning discussions. They, these are conversations that you definitely don't have once. <laughs> you have con them multiple times, but 
early on having discussions about at very least who would your substitute decision maker be? Are you talking to them about your wishes? How, do, how well do they know you? How well do, do they understand how you feel about things in your illness can be really important because as communication changes and as cognition and potentially can be infected, it is really important to do that. The other thing is the cognitive impacts have major impacts on caregivers, especially if it is the person seems to have pretty normal cognition, but they have cognitive effects that are impacting on their decision making. They're often still felt to be capable of making their own decisions, but that those changes may make it harder for their caregivers. Um, and if they have more severe um, cognitive changes in that smaller percentage, they can be have major implications for care needs for managing their care, particularly in home settings. So it is really important for us to be aware of this issue and paying attention and looking for it. And along with the um, cognitive issues, there are also some mood symptoms. So Dr. Watt's gonna talk about that. All right, we're, we're nearly there, everybody. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk very quickly about pseudobulbar affect. Um, which it can be a very dramatic symptom if, if it's something that you've seen. Um, it's essentially sudden uncontrollable laughing or crying or, or often called like emotional incontinence. Um, it can sometimes be triggered from a real emotion and it's almost like the loss of an off switch. So somebody is feeling sad and then um, in, in, instead of being able to kind of like gather themselves and, and uh, internalize kind of how they're feeling, um, it leads to this kind of uncontrollable crying or sometimes it doesn't have a trigger at all. And, and for any of you who have seen um, the like Batman movie with Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker, um, his laugh was modeled after somebody with a pseudobulbar affect laugh. Um, and so uh, we're gonna talk very quickly about Mrs. O. So she's a 49 year old woman with ALS um, and she has increased emotionality. She's describing unprovoked crying, uh, which is hard to control, but she tells you she does not feel sad. Um, and so it's starting to kind of bother her life. She's worried about going to the store. Um, and she asks you like, what can we do about this? So all of these are options for treating pseudobulbar affect except one. Okay, so we got a high here at 41% between answers A and B. A and B, okay. So the answer is B. So um, there's a few different options for managing pseudobulbar affect. It can be managed uh, first off by non-pharmacological options. So distraction, um, other non-pharmacological methods. Uh, I had one lady who, when she would start crying, she would like get up and she would go outside. And for some reason that helped her, um, it kind of helped her kind of be distracted and, and reset a little bit. Um, but if it's impacting function or is very distressing to the patient, um, you have a few different options. Um, SSRIs, fluoxetine, escitalopram, something like that is an option, and particularly if there is a bit of a mood component or something else that's, that's um, playing into that. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, so like amitriptyline is uh, one that we might use, particularly if the person has um, sialuria or other uh, symptoms where uh, the desirable side effects of amitriptyline might, uh, might be beneficial. And then the other one that is often used is uh, dextromethorphan quinidine, uh, or the trade name for that is Nudexa. Um, and that's a, a medication where I, I actually re-looked it up today and the mechanism for that is still unknown, um, but it seems to work for our patients. Uh, and it's a, it's a medication that's uh, compounded at 20 milligrams of the dextromethorphan and 10 milligrams of the quinidine. There's a commercial form in the United States, but we have to compound it. Yes, yes. <laughs> Nudexa is like, it, it's called Nudexa um, in the States, but we uh, here practically are compounding it ourselves. I will say that pseudobulbar affect is not specifically like a mood disorder. So a lot of people confuse it with, um, with being depressed or, or being really happy or, or it actually being something like pathological related to mood. Um, but mood disorders often very, very commonly coexist with this. Um, not only like mood disorders, like depression, anxiety, but also just coping, um, adjustment disorders, those kinds of things obviously are, are quite common in our patients. 
Um, so this is a, a little table that kind of separates depression from like a pseudo vulvar affect type picture. Um, and I won't read through every single one, but knowing that um, often like the affect of a person in pseudo vulvar affect is um, kind of independent of, of mood. Whereas like if somebody's feeling really depressed, they might feel sad or worried or guilty or some of those other things um, that are quite common. Um, but, uh, and, and the other pieces, like they, they really don't have voluntary control of their, of their laughing and crying type pictures. Um, whereas in depression, you may be able to like modulate, modulate that by the situation. Okay. So Dr. Rice is gonna talk about advanced care planning and I'm gonna talk about end of life and then we will be all done. Uh, and I was just going to mention in, in a comment to Dr. Watt's um, previous one that the medication response for the pseudobulbar affect, even if you're using an antidepressant, it tends to be very quicker, much quicker than it is for a mood disorder. And so it can be actually helpful partly to distinguish them because it's the same drug. So it can be a little bit hard. If you're sure if there's a mix. So it, the, the elements of the suitable for affect often will settle within a few days or a week, whereas for mood disorder symptoms, we expect it to take longer to settle. So some patients, you actually get improvement right away um, or almost right away, which can be helpful and helpful to, to let them know. So for the switch to the advanced care planning piece, and uh, when we think about our cases, is there one of those cases where you think that it would be more important important to do advanced care planning. So the person with the motor presentation, the person with the bulbar presentation, um, rest, I'm just saying Mr. D oh, with the cognitive changes, um, and then uh, the person with the suitable rasp. Is there, and you only get to choose one, which one would you tend to pick if you were having to only do advanced care planning with one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think most people have answered now. And the most common at 53% is Mr. D, followed by Mr. D at 28%, and then tied between um, Mrs. WK and uh, Mrs. O at 10%. And obviously this is a little bit of a trick question because even though a, advanced care planning is often hopefully way before any of this and we've started it right off the ground. So, and our time is usually not so rationed. We have to say we can only have advanced care dis planning discussions with one patient or another. Obviously we need to be having these conversations early and re and repeating them frequently because the, the, the people's goals, people's uh, wishes, people's ability to adapt and cope to their illness is very, very variable. So their, th their, their thoughts about uh, their things can change dramatically over time. If people are having things where we're worried about having to be making decisions quickly and we haven't had the conversations, you might prioritize, you know, someone who's already having respiratory and swallowing challenges because we're facing decisions imminently. Um, someone with cognitive changes, if we're worried they may worsen, um, you might want to have those early. But the honest truth is, have the have the conversations early and have them awful often because any of these patients are at risk for needing assistance with decision making. All of them have illnesses that are going to progress over time and that um, will require decision making. And the more time they have to think about it, discuss their options is important. But recognizing these decisions are often very fluid. And I've had people who say they would like all sorts of interventions who change their mind as their illness progresses. And others who said, I'm not gonna take any interventions who again, change their mind as their illness progresses. So we need to have these conversations frequently and often. In the study that we did, um, you know, we didn't, we found that um, there was actually nothing that impacted the, on the occurrence of advanced care planning discussions in the study that we had there. Um, and so really, there's not a right time, there's not a right place, there's not a right symptom. Um, it's important to have these conversations with everybody, 
including all the people who don't have ALS, <laughs> but everybody having them early as possible, having them often, having them with everybody, and recognizing that the decisions really do tend to change over time. Each person's illness is their own. And so making sure we're checking in regu regularly with them on these issues. Did you want to speak to the maid? Um, one of the questions we don't, we aren't going to talk a lot about MAID, um, although the ALS population has been very front and center a lot around the discussions of, of medical assistance in dying. And it is true that neurological conditions did count for nearly 13% of MAID cases in 2022. So this is a common conversation that comes up. I've actually had patients think they were supposed to use MAID because it was so common, uh, it's such a common discussion in the ALS population. Um, so I had one person sort of say, well, I guess I have, I should do MAID because I don't want to do X, Y, or Z. Um, but um, it is a common uh, cause uh, for ALS and patients with other neuromuscular diseases. So it often is something we bring up with our patients, um, but recognizing still that many of our patients do choose to have a natural sort of a sent, uh, end of life using palliative care supports. Um, so it's still really important. Um, to not assume that everyone is going to want to use MAID as well. Okay. All right, so this is our last little section here. Um, and then we'll be able to open the floor up for a little bit more, um, more questions. Um, so we're just going to talk briefly about kind of end of life care in general in the, in the ALS population. And, and um, so the acute end of life period, and when I'm talking about acute end of life, I'm talking final, you know, hours to days um, is very similar to the general population. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about basic symptom management there. Um, however, there are a few things um, that are specific to the ALS population that we have to consider. And one of those is uh, stopping ALS therapies. And Dr. Zwicker is going to touch on that. Um, so there's no um, rules around this, but uh, I guess my approach and I the approach of Dr. Briner, if, if people are having symptoms, side effects from the therapies, uh, then we have a pretty low threshold to stop the medications because as we discussed, they're not super effective uh, in the first place. Um, the second situation where you might uh, stop those medications is if the patient's quality of life has deteriorated to a point that they're really not satisfied with it. So there's no point in prolonging that uh, quality of life uh, and taking those medications. And the third instance is if they're uh, obtaining the medications through the exceptional access program, there are um, stipulations that the medication has to be stopped at a certain time. Like for Riluzole, it's really only if they're having invasive ventilation, uh, but for Adarivone, um, there's some specific requirements that if they're not ambulatory and they can't feed themselves, then the Adarivone should be stopped. Um, so those are kind of some thoughts. Yeah, I think we, we end up in a really unique position with the ALS patients who have um, PEG feeds, like G-tubes, because we have a direct route where we can administer these medications almost indefinitely. And so a lot of the times, like, stopping it isn't, we're not stopping it because the person can't swallow anymore, which is what often happens in, in non-ALS patients that don't have a feeding tube. Um, so it does involve a little bit more thought and conversation. Yeah. Um, the other things we talk about are stopping peg feeds. And so that can be done slowly, you know, tapering down feeds. And um, a lot of times the families like that because they, they want to confirm that their loved one isn't feeling hungry or, or something like that. Uh, or I've seen the decision made where they just want to stop all at once. Um, but peg tubes, having a peg tube in general can be helpful for medication administration and those kinds of things, even if you're not using it in feeds, uh, for feeds. So they often, you know, we, we're not in the business of pulling out somebody's peg tube if they're not using it. The other one that we often talk about is stopping BiPAP or any form of respiratory support that the person might have. Um, if you have somebody who's very, very BiPAP dependent, like using it continuously, can't take it off. When you stop BiPAP, uh, usually you can expect the end of life very quickly, you know, hours often. Um, and uh, whereas if they're kind of using it intermittently and they decide I don't want to use it anymore, it may be more of a progressive process. Um, but often when we're stopping BiPAP in general, we want to be prepared. We want to be prepared for that feeling of dyspnea, for that feeling of air hunger. Sometimes people feel really panicked. Um, sometimes they're feeling, um, they get a delirium from a bit of like a CO2 retention. Um, and so we're, we, you want to be prepared. We're not stopping it and then checking in the next day and saying like, oh, how are you feeling? You want to make sure the person has medications. Um, and so often those medications are uh, regular opioids, especially if they're significantly BiPAP dependent. 
um, and potentially a benzodiazepine. Um, and so if the person is opioid naive, never been on opioids before, or is on a low dose, um, you might want to start like one to two milligrams uh, subcutaneously, or if they have a G-tube, you can give it via G-tube um, every four hours, um, and then adding some PRN midazolam. Um, sometimes we're using midazolam infusions. And if the person isn't opioid naive or is already on a significant amount of opioids and um, benzodiazepines to help with this dyspnea, which is quite common, then you may want to look at using um, uh, palliative sedation guidelines and looking at more starting a midazolam infusion and, and via a CAD and um, having just a lot more uh, nursing supports and those kinds of things, depending on where the person is, to make sure that their symptoms are managed um, well for the time. Okay. We've reached the end, I think. So we'll all come back now and uh, we're, we're open to answering any questions you might have. You've done a great job of answering as you've been going along there. There was a couple earlier on that I was wondering about, um, uh, probably for Dr. Zwicker. So um, is there any relationship like around incidence and prevalence? So is there any relation to the, um, income or socioeconomic status um, for ALS. people with ALS? ALS? Or yeah. is that related to the palliative uh, care? No, related to the ALS itself, yeah. Um, I don't believe so. No, okay. And then- i um, the military, please. Mm. <laughs> Just because that is a population where the funding is definitely different. Um, in terms of the incidence? Yeah, yeah, whether that that how strong that link is, and yeah. That, yeah. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. I guess in depth, um, yeah. and and I'm just mentioning the fact that because um, there has been some thought and some argument that there may be a higher incidence in people who work in the military, um, those who have worked in the military who develop ALS. Um, get a lot of support through Veterans Affairs um, for their illness and um, because it's considered that there's a risk it could be occupationally linked. And so people in the military who develop ALS have, do have access to other resources. How strong that link is between the profession is a little unclear, um, but it has been sort of successfully argued with the Veterans Affairs that they need to at least consider it and they are supporting it accordingly. So another question about, oh, I'm sorry for the audio here on my side. Um, the, uh, the prevalence, it seems like to some providers we're seeing more and more um, patients with ALS. And I guess the question is, is it because referral to palliative care is becoming more common and palatable or are there actually more people with ALS? Yeah, I don't know that there are more people with ALS, although it does feel like that, I, but I was, from my point of view, yeah. but I think we definitely are involving palliative care more. Uh, definitely in Ottawa, we are doing that. Yeah. I can tell you that as we were planning the neuropalliative clinic and going into the, um, uh, the ALS clinic, we were told that over the last three years, the numbers of new consults for ALS patients hasn't changed dramatically. So I don't think that there's a dramatic increase in the number of new ALS okay. cases. Yeah. So certainly th we're seeing one. Well. We were talking a bit about how you diagnose it. And I think one thing that has changed is there's more of an urgency to diagnose it um, because as we develop more treatments, uh, you know, there's a thought, maybe not proven scientifically, that maybe these treatments will help if we start them earlier, help more if we start them earlier, preserve motor neurons. And for the medications, uh, well, especially Adirovon and Albriosa, there is a criteria that they have to have symptom onset within two years. Um, so there is more pressure now to diagnose ALS earlier. And there's a question, why? why? Why is there more pressure for early diagnosis? Why is there more urgency? I think, I think <laughs> the question got answered. Yeah, <laughs> perfect, great. <laughs> so um, there was a couple of questions around, you know, conversations around intervention. So the G tube, um, the when should the conversation around uh, inserting a G tube be brought up with for the patient? Is there you know timing around this? And I think you did share some of the um, the clinical things you would look for. But are there other pieces around that um, intervention that yeah. you know? There we go. 
that one. So that's the guidelines for insertion. It wouldn't necessarily be what I would say is the guidelines for discussing it. Um, often I find when I'm meeting somebody for the first time, I say, you know, do you have any questions about the future? What's potentially to come? And I think the, the ALS clinic does a similar thing where they talk about all of the possibilities as they're, as, as that, they, that could happen in the future, just to give that information. You know, I, we, we often say like, sometimes people need a G-tube, like first visit, um, or first or second kind of visit to just have that in the person's mind. Um, then as we're starting to see changes, we kind of maybe have a bit more of a specific conversation if the person hasn't asked any other questions. Yeah, I must say, I agree. It's often brought up earlier, are people aware of it? But as soon as we start to, when we're watching those uh, scores that we're checking at every visit, as soon as they're starting to get any swallowing problems, um, it tends to bring up that conversation again. As soon as we're seeing any decline in their respiratory function, because we know there tends to be a concern about doing uh, the interventions like peg tubes early enough with declining. So any of those changes, as soon as we start to see them, if the conversations haven't come up, then they tend already, they tend to come up again at that point. And I guess similar kind of question around um, removal of uh, non-invasive ventilation support. Yeah. So what are some prep questions or comments to help prepare patients for removing bypass? I must say, I usually have the approach of checking with people as they're who are using their BiPAP about how they're doing with it. How are they feeling about it? How is their, how are they feeling about their quality of life when you're having those general conversations? Um, because when you start to open those doors, if they're struggling with their BiPAP, if they're getting frustrated, then that sort of opens the door for having those conversations about, oh, well, how am I feeling about it? No, it's driving me crazy. Then you sort of can open those doors of, is it something you're still wanting to continue? If they're facing, I find for a lot of people, when they start to have needing the BiPAP during the day, that's a real critical juncture because we're having a mask on really impairs communication if, if people can still speak. So as their BiPAP is, again, there are often natural discussion points when you're, and especially it's helping now that we've get to getting to know people earlier, mm -hmm. um, that, that you can have those discussions and see how they're feeling about um, their BiPAP. Similarly, for people who are following increasingly at the St. Vincent site, a number of patients who are on invasive ventilation, um, and with them, again, at regular visits, how are you coping with this? How are you feeling about it? it? It comes up often, and people often do get to a point where they say, you know, they've had enough, they're ready to withdraw. Um, at um, one point, you had a, a slide up with the, um, the members of the multidisciplinary team. I'm wondering if somebody could go back to that because somebody asked if you could put together the best support team for ALS, a dream team, what would it look like? And so I'm just wondering, are there folks like team members that you would add if resources were no question at all? Oh, I, I do. I would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is always yes. yes. <laughs> I, this is a great list of teams. I would love to add like a psychologist, spiritual care, somebody yeah. to help with like emotional well being. Absolutely. Um, I would love to add like a caregiver liaison, somebody who is there just for the caregivers. Um, and that's their dedicated role. I think we touched on it a little bit, but potentially did not really talk in great detail just the impact that this has on caregivers. Yes. Yeah, somebody to help them <coughs> navigate the system. And I mean, we didn't mention there, but often <coughs> community care is involved. So the community care manager is part of their their care team. Mm -hmm. And oh, the other person I didn't mention actually is the ALS Canada group. So the ALS mm -hmm. Canada group is very active in supporting every patient with ALS. Uh, so I actually didn't have them on that. And I actually wanted to mention in terms of the equipment, especially because patients often need equipment for long periods of time and changing equipment. We know in the palliative care, you know, you can get a hospital bed for two weeks and then you have to start paying for it as often. But the ALS Society does have equipment <coughs> tools um, that people can access. And so uh, for people who may not have the resources to buy their own, um, the ALS Society is really helpful at, at getting people equipment that they're not having to fund themselves for long periods of time. And so the ALS web, uh, the ALS Society website is a really good um, source for resources. So those of you in the group may want to have a look at that. And it has the links on it for um, applications for um, equipment and things like that. Yeah, there are a lot of resources actually on that website, the ALS. So it'd be a really good Society of Canada website, yeah. 
Um, I was wondering, could you comment a little bit more on what are some of the common needs that family members have or caregivers have? There are <laughs> infinite. I'm, I mean, there's so, this population is so complex, as you can see by the whole team that's needed to look after them. And, uh, and it's changing. So you just, you just get to a point where you have all the equipment you need, you've kind of got a system in place, and then the clinical context changes. And so now you're like, okay, now I need some other group of, so it, it's very challenging for <coughs> caregivers, for sure. So things like time, respite time, um, all of those things. People, often the family givers, family more than patients worry about leaving the person alone, especially as their mobility. So just that constant need to be present. Mm -hmm. um, again, so needing that psychological and social spiritual support, not just for the patient, but also for their caregivers, because this is, you know, a, you often, usually a several year process and it's a steady, grieving each loss as it occurs and also anticipating those losses in advance which adds um stresses but not only to the patient but to their caregiving uh team and their like their family around them yeah i, I noticed there were a few questions about location for maid that were coming up in the chat um i just want to clarify around the hospices different hospices across our region have different practices around made provision on site and I know some of our participants have answered those other questions as they've uh, they've come up in the chat. So most of made, I believe, is done in people's homes, like in the community. It's common. Yeah, yeah it's quite common. Yeah. yeah. The the other thing that's interestingly come up with for me a couple of times relatively recently is organ donation and this population, mm -hmm. and so patients who are on ventilators have high BiPAP needs either through with, with MAID or with withdrawal of ventilation, there is sometimes opportunity for organ donation if that's something the patient wants. Um, so often that's coordinated by you know, the person who's going to remove the ventilator, usually then does require that either the ventilator removal or the MAID process take place in hospital, so that mm -hmm. can happen. But organ donation is an option in some cases. And so it's something that patients or their families may bring up and it is uh, something that can be explored. And it would be with uh, Trillium Gift of Life. Yeah, with Trillium Gift of Life, yeah, exactly. But it needs to be coordinated. And I think they, uh, groups like the MAID team and, and, and anyone involved in ventilator withdrawal would, would know about that. And so there are systems in place to successfully navigate that. But in that case, if they were going to have MAID and wanted to be an organ donor, they'd have to actually have MAID in the hospital. Yeah, but those in those cases, it has to be in the hospital. And usually has to be in a, a larger hospital um, that has the infrastructure to work with Trillium for the organ harvest. Eileen, I, I see that you're, I, I'm not sure if you've signed off yet, but there it says what percentage of patients are on any of the meds to slow progression? Like Most all? of them, yeah. <laughs> Almost 100% yeah. um, are on at least, uh, at least the rilazole. rilazole. Yeah. I've met the odd person who had side effects from the rilazole and stopped it, um, but, but most, most. Um, What's the end of life tend to be like for patients in terms of ALS distressing symptoms like pain, struggle to breathe before death? This can be quite fearful, fearful for patients. Um, yeah. uh, it's a good question. So the end of life period tends to be reasonably similar. Um, pretty, manageable, and pretty manageable. Yeah. As long as you have a plan for respiratory symptoms uh, with a, a bypass withdrawal. This has been studied. And in the studies, they do say that patients generally die in comfort so uh, not in respiratory distress so i think that is something you can share with families that you know we can manage this and uh, it does not have to be uncomfortable so i think uh, i may i made a shameless plug for our caregiver education program um Kay Mulder has also shared, I'm just sharing it for everybody, um, you know, having vis a, an option, um, the community programs through our hospices. So um, the volunteer visitors or uh, family supports available through the hospices might also be something that could uh, help to, to, to family caregivers. So 
And depending on people's needs, there are some long-term care that will do respite stays. And with planning, um, St. Vincent's I know sometimes does respite stays as well um, uh, so that people's families can have a, a bit of a longer respite time or if a family member is anticipating a surgery or something like that, sometimes you can plan for that depending on their needs. Well, we're, we're starting to get the kudos coming in and I do want to thank everybody, our panelists, as well as our participants. Carl and I were a little bit worried about the Thursday evening before a long weekend and uh, we've had a great turnout tonight and some really um, thoughtful comments and questions and uh, just again a big thank you to our panelists for taking time to prepare and offer this uh, this um, training to our, our region and uh, folks will be able to look for it uh, online uh, soon. So Carl, I'll turn things over to you. Yeah, and I, I've, oh, I, we just had one last question there in the chat. I uh, just come up, it got hidden a little in the thank yous, but it's, it, is it, is there more males yeah. than females with ALS? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not much different though. But thank you all for coming yeah, on yes. the Thursday evening <laughs> yeah. of a long yeah. weekend. We appreciate it. <laughs>